All right, so let me keep it 100% real with you. I have a goal of making 50,000 subs by the end of the year, and I'm pretty much willing to name drop out my ass until I get there. What's up, beautiful? Thank you for coming back. If you are new here, my name is Caswell, and congratulations, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. I put out weekly content, uh, sometimes twice a week, and I pretty much talk about whatever I want. Today, I'm going to talk about my experience with RuPaul. So, so we just start at the beginning. Before we do, somebody has given me the saddest eyes. Okay, come here. Come here. Come here. <laughs> you can all right, so I'm in the car with Elvis today. We are getting new floors in the bedrooms and the bathrooms today. So there's a bunch of construction workers up there. So I don't think he wanted to stay there anyway. He likes to go wherever daddy goes. Ain't that right? All right, chill out. I just want to get out of the way. If you thought that you were going to come here and I was going to drag RuPaul, you are sorely mistaken. That's not the point of this. I generally don't drag anybody, but this is just about my experience with RuPaul. I don't know. If you love RuPaul like I do, then you probably like hearing any stories about him that you haven't heard before. So, you know, when RuPaul You Better Work came out, that song hit, and I was a teenager, um, that that song meant a lot. It was a big deal that a drag queen had a song that was charting, that was at the VMA. So RuPaul made a big impact on my life just as far as being gay and out. So I always admired RuPaul. It was the summer before I moved to New York City. I was working in Provincetown uh, doing anything. Like I was had a bunch of jobs actually. It doesn't really matter. But that's when I read his book and I believe it's called letting it all hang out. Sidebar, my favorite books to read are autobiographies and my favorite book of all time is Boy George, Take It Like a Man. That book is everything. I've read that book like four times. If you know that book and you love it like I do, leave a message down below, but I highly recommend it. So I read Letting It All Hang Out and I remember being really impressed after hearing RuPaul's story because it was actually one of the only times I ever heard him talk about alcohol addiction. I've never heard him talk about it within the past 10 years. I could totally be wrong, but I haven't heard about it. And I remember RuPaul talking about how he was drinking a lot and it came to a point that he would have a glass of vodka with a splash of cranberry and he still couldn't taste the vodka anymore. And once he got rid of his old habits, he really started to shine and his dreams started to come true. And I love stories like that. So I remember being inspired by his book and being like, oh yeah, I, I, I f*** with RuPaul. Like, he's, he's really cool, you know? Um, and at the time, I think RuPaul was just uh, dropping singles and no longer really an MTV. And I like the VH1 show wasn't happening anymore, but he was still dropping music consistently so very shortly after I moved to New York I moved into my friend Michael's apartment who I talked to about in my last video and Michael and all his friends are kind of from RuPaul's school if you live in New York and you're familiar with the club scene there then they're kind of different generations of club kids so Michael came from the generation of people that were you know partying in the East Village and uh, the Pyramid Club was always packed and just like that club kid Michael Alec era, even a little bit before the Michael Alec era is when he came here. So so what I'm trying to say is a lot of the people that RuPaul talked about in his book, like Larry T, Floyd, um, I don't know, I can think of like 10 others right now, but um, I started to meet those people soon after I moved to New York City because they were still in the scene and connected. So as I started to do music and since I started to know these people, I think that me and RuPaul were kind of in the same circle. RuPaul, I don't believe, lived in New York City anymore. I believe that he had already moved to Los Angeles. But I knew who RuPaul was. And I, as I started to drop music, like when I dropped All Over Your Face and uh, my career started popping, I know that he knew who I was. That's just for later. So the first time I ever met RuPaul face to face was probably like two or three years before Drag Race came out. And it was at the bus stop. And I was crossing uh, First Avenue on 9th Street and I was headed towards Union Square. And I saw, see this, I see this tall, thin, um, black guy, but very, had a real androgynous look. Like I knew from far away that it was RuPaul because RuPaul just has some type of aura about her. So I go, so RuPaul's wearing this whole like sailor look, but really androgynous, like super cute, like had this sailor hat on with like this, uh, this belly shirt kind of body was looking tight though. Some white sailor top and some denim, like sailor pants, but like perfectly fitted with these white shiny shoes. Just had a look and I felt comfortable enough introducing myself to RuPaul 
Paul because like I said I knew we knew some of the same people and I was making music she was making music we kind of talked about in the same circles at that time so we started talking to Rue and Rue was like oh do you live in the East Village I'm just visiting for a little bit and she was telling me that she's taking the bus to go to a favorite uh, Cuban restaurant of hers in the West Village so we just had a little chit chat it was nice to introduce myself to her no big deal so the next time I met RuPaul was not even a year later and it was at a gay pride party and I think Minneapolis and it was for Minneapolis pride but it was at a restaurant that they turned into a club at night so it was very straight owned and operated but they brought gay talent in for this gay pride but it was a lot of straight people there like it wasn't what you typically think of when you think of like a gay pride party it was like in this big steakhouse restaurant that they have a stage on I remember the stage was pretty big and it had a runway and um, you know it wasn't your typical small club stage it was it was big and I was playing there with RuPaul and the village people sidebar <laughs> this is kind of interesting but so the village people when they tour it's not the original village people I think the Indian I, I don't know his name off the top of my head uh, is still there or he was 10 years ago when I did, had this gig or um, in like Randy the cowboy he's not touring with them they they literally get like actors or male performers that would be around the same age as the village people are now and they get on stage and they do the number so if you go see the village people it's actually not the original village people and that's one of the reasons you're not allowed to take pictures with them anymore or at least that night that I played there you weren't allowed to take pictures of them and I think it was because they're not actually the village people that's that so my sound check was at noon. I got there at 11.45, but RuPaul had not showed up for her sound check at 11.30 yet. So when I got there, I was like, look, like I can just do this really, really quick. It will take me less than five minutes. You know, it's a track act. I just don't want any reverb. I don't have to go through every song. I just want to make sure the mic's working okay. And it, no matter where I stand on stage, I won't get any feedback. Like it's easy. And the sound guy said to me, he says, no, I can't do that because if RuPaul all of a sudden shows up and sees you doing your sound check during what's supposed to be RuPaul's time, he might get really upset because his manager was really specific about it and I'm like um, okay that's fine so I'll wait so the situation is I'm still waiting for Paul to show up for his sound check he's already 15 minutes late but I'm like that's fine he'll show up and do a sound check I'll wait it's not a big deal and then the sound, the sound guy gets off the phone he hangs up he goes okay everyone RuPaul's five minutes away everybody downstairs so I don't think he's talking to me and I don't really know exactly what's going on but so all of a sudden like all the people that work in the restaurant like the waiters the bus boys the cooks, the staff, the cleaners, like everyone that sets up for the restaurant before they open is going downstairs to the basement. Hey, what's up? Future Caswell here. I'm editing and I was just thinking about you. And I was going to ask you so kindly that if you are enjoying this story, would you pretty please with sugar on top, subscribe to my channel. I truly appreciate it. Why don't you do that right now while I take a sip of this delicious Kroger apple juice. Go ahead. Need more time? <sighs> Did it? Done? Okay, let's go. So the sound guy comes up to me, goes, I'm sorry, Kaz, you gotta go downstairs. I'm like, why do I have to go downstairs? I'm performing. I'm waiting for a sound check. He goes, well, it's in RuPaul's contract that no one is allowed to see him out of drag except for the sound engineer. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, he goes, but don't worry. As soon as we're done, I'll call you right back upstairs. He's only five minutes away. So I'm just thinking... Okay, all right, I'm a team player. So so I go down in the basement. The uh, It's a basement basement. Like the, the ceilings are like five and a half feet tall and I'm six, one and a half. So everyone is down there like crunching like this, like they're in a fallout shelter and it's hot and there's no ventilation. I just remember texting my manager like, I'm so f***ing pissed off right now. <laughs> like I'm just thinking, why am I downstairs in the basement? Because RuPaul doesn't want anyone to see him out of drag. I am not feeling this at all. And in my mind, I was dragging him. I'm not gonna lie, I was I was upset. And then, I don't know, I would assume that RuPaul doesn't have the same rule now, but I think there was a time that maybe drag queens were more iffy about people seeing them on I don't know, I don't know, I don't care. But all I know is I had to wait downstairs in the basement because RuPaul didn't want anyone to see him out of drag. Okay, RuPaul's a superstar, I'm gonna respect that. But I was pissed. So we're waiting down there for like 
half hour, 40 minutes, I guess. So I, I, we all go upstairs. I go upstairs. And when we do, I remember seeing RuPaul outside uh, waiting to get into his limousine. And he gets in. I remember, okay, that's RuPaul. Out of drag. No big deal. So I did my sound check. It took like three minutes. And the sound guy was like, oh, you were right. You really don't take much time. I'm like, see, you should just let me go. It would have been fine. But anyway, so I show up that night. And it was a pretty good crowd. And there was an, there was some local performer that performed. And then I performed. And then, I, then, then after that, it was RuPaul and then the Village People. And I have to say, this is my first time ever seeing RuPaul live. I think actually the only time I've ever seen RuPaul like, perform live right, right in front of my face. And any type of saltiness I had or slight animosity based on the fact that I had to wait downstairs in the basement while he did his sound check was all wiped away once I saw RuPaul perform. I'm going to tell you something. RuPaul blew my mind. RuPaul probably does not get enough credit for how much of a brilliant live performer she is. And I got to say, first of all, this, this was the first time I ever noticed a drag queen in padding before, or maybe I just hadn't paid attention to it before, which is highly possible. But I specifically remember this because I remember when I saw RuPaul going into his limousine, he looked like a tall, skinny guy, like, like stick figure, you know, like no body shape. But then when he came out, he's wearing these hot pants and he had the hips and the titties. And just, it was just like, and he was just such a great performer. And one of the reasons that made a show so great was he was doing songs at the time from his star booty soundtrack that a lot of people didn't know, but he just performed it so well. He was completely, Completely captivating, you know? So I was just blown away by RuPaul's stage presence and how great a performer RuPaul was. So any feelings I had before that about like waiting, they were gone. So after that, after the show, RuPaul was signing autographs and doing a little bit of a meet and greet. And I did go up to RuPaul and uh, gave her a hug and said she did a great performance. So after that steakhouse incident, I hadn't seen RuPaul for about a year. So I get a call from my manager. So my manager calls me up because, hey, I don't know if you heard about this, but RuPaul is starting a reality TV show and she's doing the pilot right now. And the boys at World of Wonder called me up and they said they want to know if you want to go in and teach the girls how to rap. And I'm like, yeah, totally. He's like, he's like, you know, no one's getting paid for this. I don't really know what to expect from the show, if it's going to get big, but I flew it to LA and, um, I remember, you know, for this whole thing, I don't, I, I would assume it is much different now. I mean, this is season one. So this is the Vaseline on the lens season that I don't even know if you can see them on Hulu. I haven't, I haven't checked, but if I find some clips, I'm obviously going to put it in here. So when I showed up, you know, it wasn't like super fancy, but it, it wasn't a decent set, you know, and, um, you know, I did my own makeup. I The only time I met RuPaul during shooting this was when, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a time, I think maybe up until the second or third season that even the judges walked down the runway. So I just did a little runway walk, even though I wasn't one of the judges, I was just a special guest. It was the final three. It was the last episode of season one. And I taught, oh my God, I'm going to forget. Okay. So it was BB Zahara Benet, Rebecca Glasscock and Nina Flowers. So it was really easy. It was really fun. I just schooled them on how to rewrite their rap. I remember at the time that Rebecca Glasscock came with like not even four bars. <laughs> I'm taking some girl from the voice of experience. You want to fix that walk if you want to look fierce. I know a simple and effective way to better it all. You got to put some bass if you want to do the walk. Uh-huh. Bass, honey. Glasscock for your nerves, mama. Okay, you have four bars of nothing. My girl, like, step it up, you know, like, let's try to do this really, really quick. So then, and, uh, but BB and Nina, they were on their shit. So I will say after I finished recording my scenes, I was where the camera guys were and I was kind of watching. I remember talking to one of the producers and he's explaining the show to me. He's like, yeah, we're making the girls sew their own outfits. I'm like, you're making the girls sew their own outfits. He goes, yes. I'm like, you are evil. <laughs> Like, they have to sew everything. That's what he told me at the time. Obviously, they don't have to sew all the outfits now. But that was originally part of the theme. Because this is the final episode. So this was like the last day of filming. I remember RuPaul coming out. And before she introduces the category and everything, she says to everyone on stage, she goes, Hey, I just want you to know, I've been in this business a very long time. This is the best crew I've ever worked with. And I thank you all from the bottom of my heart for working so hard to make this show happen. And she it was really heartfelt. You could tell she really meant it. And uh, all the hard work that everyone put into it, every, she saw it. So I thought that was really cool. But it was one of those shows that after they came out, everyone, at least everyone gay, saw the potential in this show. 
And I remember like it got into People Magazine and remember the prize was only $10,000 and People Magazine did some article about Drag Race. They were like, the stakes couldn't be lower. <laughs> You win ten thousand dollars and get to go on a cruise with Absolute, you know. But uh, but I knew in the back of my head that this has potential to be huge. So I'm really honored that I got to be a part of the show, whether no matter what season it is. So I, I'm really grateful for that. The next time I heard from RuPaul was probably about three years later, and I don't. She called me. Let me see. Do I? I don't remember giving RuPaul my number, but I remember. Do I have RuPaul's number? Let me check. I've never just called... Motherfucker. I have RuPaul's number. I don't remember giving RuPaul my number. She must have just got... She probably just got it from World of Wonder. So RuPaul had called me. But we must have exchanged numbers because I remember when she called me, it came up RuPaul. I'm like, RuPaul's calling me. So RuPaul, RuPaul called me about three years later. And at the time that track uh, Peanut Butter with Big Frida was popping, I was playing that all the time. So she called me. I remember one of the first thing I said in the conversation was like, yo, that Peanut Butter track is lit. Like I play that every Thursday night, blah, blah, blah. Like congratulations on everything. You know, the show's come a long way. So now we're there in like season three or four or something maybe. And she called me. And so she said that she had a song called Lick It and she wanted me to rap on it. I was like, yeah, totally, totally. And it, so all I know is, I gave her my manager's information. Everything has to go through my manager, so just give him a call. And then I never heard anything. So I actually don't know what happened. Um, I love my manager. I, he's not my manager anymore. Uh, it's it's a fair statement to say we had ups and downs. So maybe this was at a time that we were at a down, and I never really checked up on what happened with the RuPaul phone call. So to this day, I have no idea what happened. I have no, absolutely no idea what happened. I don't know if there was some crazy contract. I don't know if there's some crazy publishing or not getting put I have no idea and I just got wrapped into whatever I was wrapped up in at the time and I never chucked up on it I should have <laughs> but so Nina to say I didn't end up going on that lick it so and I think she ended up doing it with Lady Bunny RuPaul if you're listening let's do a track honey so I want to go into the last time I saw RuPaul and had a conversation with her which is kind of like a beautiful full circle moment for me so now RuPaul is huge you know RuPaul's got Emmys. Uh, she had just got her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I remember the day before the last time I saw RuPaul, me and my roommate were watching the original Wigstock. And this is all happening during the height of the You Better Work era. And she's pushing the song You Better Work. And everyone is introduced to RuPaul because of You Better Work. And she's saying, I worked really hard. I focused. I paid my dues. I did this. I did that. But she ends the conversation with, and look at me now. And then me and my roommate both look at each other and we were like, nah, bitch, look at you now. <laughs> like now you got Emmys and you're on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and everyone loves the show. Like now look at you, bitch. Like this is crazy. So the next day, it's kind of crazy. This happened next day. I'm on La Brea and Sunset and I'm walking north i have no sense of direction in la i think i'm walking yeah, i think i'm walking north so i'm a, if you know la brea and sunset i'm where the gas station is and i'm walking uh across the street towards hollywood on the same side that like ralph's is at okay so i'm i'm walking north i'm on the left side of the street and i look to the right of me walking towards me crossing the street coming towards me and this is really tall thin black guy like like i'm six one and a half RuPaul appears to be 6'4", 6'5", no heels on. And so I remember this guy's wearing like brown shoes, casual pants, I think a hoodie, but carrying a big ass Starbucks in one hand and a briefcase in the other. And I'm just like, oh, that's a peculiar looking person kind of. And then I'm like, oh, that's RuPaul. And then RuPaul walked in front of me and now we're on the same corner and we're about to cross the street and go the same direction. But I felt like RuPaul gives off this aura like she's in the zone. 
you know, like you almost like think twice before you interrupt her. I can't really explain it. It wasn't like she was giving off some cocky or majestic attitude type thing, but she's in the zone. So she's in, so she's in front of me, and I'm like, you know, I'm gonna RuPaul. I'm gonna I'm not gonna I'm give RuPaul her space. You know, I'm sure the stranger's about to notice RuPaul and say something. You know, I don't want to be one of those people. And then we're crossing the street. And, you know, she's 10 feet ahead of me and she stops where? At the bus stop. And that's why this is kind of full circle for me because the first time I met RuPaul, it was at the bus stop. And the last time I talked to her, it was at the bus stop. So you might think, like, what is RuPaul? She just got a, a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Like, what is she doing at the bus stop? But I just think that RuPaul is that kind of person that, like, doesn't give a shit. Like, one of the things I like about her, like, she's like, yeah, I got to get from A to B. I know the bus stop's right there. Like, she still thinks like a city girl, you know? Like, that's one of the reasons I really like her. And why not take the bus? Like, I don't know. I come from the, the same attitude, too. Like, I can picture myself taking the train even if I was a billionaire. Like, I'm just, I don't think, I could have all the money in the world and I still wouldn't buy a car. I might get a driver. So, RuPaul stops at the bus stop. So, I know I'm going to walk right by her. And I think to myself, you know, I kind of know her. <laughs> you know? If this was anybody else that I know or have run into the same way that I I know or have, or have run into RuPaul or talked to RuPaul, like, I would just say, hey, what's up? Like, so I decide I'm going to treat her the way I would treat anybody and just say, hey. So, I wasn't expecting a big lengthy conversation or anything like that. But she stops at the bus stop. She's waiting for the bus. And I'm walking by her. And I said, oh, hey, Ru. Nice to see you. She goes, hey, Caswell. I'm like, hey. And she gave me a hug. She goes, what are you doing in these parts? Do you live in L.A.? I'm like, yeah, I moved here a couple years ago. She goes, how do you like it? And I told her that it works much better for my wardrobe because I wear, like, tank tops and basketball shorts all the time. So it's working out really well for me. And I tell her... I like my life here. And we're just we, we're just having very light conversation. And then all of a sudden, everyone at the bus stop starts to notice that that's RuPaul waiting for the bus. And then this one girl walks by. She goes, hey, baby, I fucking love you, baby. I love you, RuPaul. I love you. She goes, uh-huh. And then this one guy who he's probably homeless. I mean, he was basically dressed like a stain and he stunk of alcohol and looked like he slept outside. I could be wrong. I don't know. He came up to RuPaul while we're talking and he's like, ah, oh, RuPaul, don't you remember Andy from 1988? And we used to hang out in the East Village. And she's like, mm-hmm, Andy, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now the thing about RuPaul that I gotta say is, she, remember how I said that RuPaul has like a certain aura about her? Like she's very present is the only way that I know how to explain like she's very in the moment and I knew that when I was having a conversation with her that she was thinking about what I was you know how sometimes you're talking to people and you're saying something but you know inside that they're just thinking about their grocery list like that wasn't RuPaul like RuPaul was like very sharing a moment with me like not not like in a super like intimate way or something like that like but just like she was in the moment and I've met very few people that give me that energy but she's very in the moment I don't know how else to explain it but then all, all this chaos starts happening so she starts dividing her time and I can see it kind of happening so anyway this guy comes over and he's like oh RuPaul blah 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 don't you remember and she's like oh yeah Andy mm -hmm. and then he wanted to go shake he wanted to go shake RuPaul's hand but RuPaul had a briefcase in one hand and like uh I uh um, and a Starbucks coffee in the other. And then she did this thing that she's like, this guy obviously wants to acknowledge her with some type of physical affection. So I think that she like lifted up her leg and I think they like, they like banged knees or something like that. Cause she's carrying a Starbucks, a coffee and a briefcase. So that was kind of interesting. So, so I said to her, I says, Oh, before I go, you know, I just want to say congratulations on all your success. Like, I love watching all of this happen for you, especially, you know, seeing what happened from the first season that I was on to now. And I told her about how just yesterday me and my roommate were watching Wigstock and how she said, look at me now. And I, and I, the last thing I said was her like, nah, bitch, look at you now. And she's like, I appreciate that, Kaz. And uh, she went away. And I, I haven't, I haven't seen her since I haven't reached out to her or anything like that. But I gotta say, like, this is what I really love about being an artist is I get the opportunity to work with people I love and admire, or if I'm familiar with their work and they're familiar with my work, then I feel comfortable talking to them about their work. We can have a back and forth. So sometimes being an artist can be really difficult and you can feel down in the dumps, but there's just little moments like that that make it all worth living.
All right, so I think that's pretty much it. Confessions behind the steering wheel. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you're new here, please like, please subscribe. You're already here. What's the harm? I am working on some new content. I also want to know, like, I'm in the beginning stages of really getting this rolling. So I'll be honest, like, sometimes I go back and forth with, all right, is this going to be more vlog? Is this going to be more story time? Is this going to be more, like, documentary style, which I do a lot of research? If you've been watching this for a while, you know I've done, like, you know, women who kill and moisturizing with the extraterrestrials. So I can do that, too. That takes a lot of time and a lot of research. I'm not afraid of it, though. I'll also say that... Sometimes I'm very, very tempted to talk about celebrities, but I don't want this to start. Like, we need another T channel, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't need to know what I think of Kanye West or the Kardashians, you know? I mean, I can talk shit all day about it, but I kind of want this channel to be an escape from all that, to be honest with you, so we can forget that there's problematic people, we can forget about politics, I can just let you into my life for about 10, 11 minutes and do it a couple times a week. So I don't know, but if you have any ideas or there's something you really like to see, I could also do it on my Patreon because I'm getting that organized. Trust me, trust and believe my Patreon will be ready soon. So anyway, I enjoyed telling you guys this story. Let me know if you liked it. I hope you learned something. I'm sure you did. And as always, big kiss, baby.